I'm excited to be with you this morning. You guys excited to be here? Yeah. Um, I, we're in the middle of a series right now called Unboxing Christmas, and the exciting thing about Unboxing Christmas is that it doesn't matter which part of Christmas you unbox, something new comes out, and you learn the beauty of the gift of Jesus and the love of God in a new way from a different angle. Every time you open up another part of Christmas, you learn the love of God in a new way, and it is an incredible gift that we have in this Christmas season. Before I get too far down the road, um, I wrote this down in my notes last night. I do have to shout out. We have a, a big congratulations to the Woodland Christian varsity football team. They won state championship last night. So big ups to Woodland Christian. We got some of the families and the young men on that team that come to a church here and they're faithful in their attendance here and, and uh, they are hard workers and I honor you guys. Congratulations on the win last night. State championship, man, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. So this morning, we're going to go into week two of Unboxing Christmas. Say, Unboxing Christmas. Unboxing Christmas. That was very good. First service was uh, cold and quiet. It ain't going to be how this one's going to be. I'm very excited about this one. We're going to unbox a different part of Christmas this morning. Last week, Pastor Keenan unboxed what? Joy. Thank you. I was just waiting for you, man. Yeah, but, yeah, but I mean... I know you know. I'm just making sure they didn't know. They, you know what I mean? We're unboxing joy last week, and it's a great thing to this week. We're going to be unboxing hope. Someone say hope. 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 Ooh. Hope is a good thing. Hope is something we all aspire to have. Hope is something that is difficult to attain unless you know where your hope comes from. Hope isn't something you can create for yourself. I promise you, if you try it, you're not going to have hope. And hope isn't something that the world knows. What the world knows is this word called a wish. And they mix hope and wish together. See, when you wish upon a star, you'll end up having disappointment and disillusionment in your life. But when you have hope in our Savior, it comes with promises and guarantees from the Word of God that will never let you down and your hope will never be cut off. This is why we as Christians, we don't wish we have a hope. My, my, my hope is not in my ability to produce. My hope is in Jira, my provider. You get what I'm saying? My hope is not in my ability to go make something happen. My, my hope is what God already made happen on my behalf. My hope is not in what I can go find and bring in. My hope is what God says, give me and let me give back. That is my hope this morning. And if we can understand that as Christians, as believers, that our hope is found in our relationship with Jesus Christ, Christ, everything changes. Yeah. Hopeless situations turn into hopeful opportunities for God to move in your life and begin to unveil his faithfulness to you in the midst of difficulty. Yeah. I'm preaching a great sermon. I'm getting way ahead of myself already. So this morning, we're going to unbox hope. Now, I brought, I brought hope with me to church. And if you're wondering if I wrapped this, sure didn't. My wife did. That's why I look so good. If I wrapped it, it would have been newspaper and duct tape. But my wife did it. And so this morning, we're going to be unboxing hope this morning. We're going to look and see what is inside of hope. Because hope isn't just a thing you have. Hope is something that is developed and built. And there are three things that the Scripture says in the book of Romans that help us get to a place of hope. This morning, we're going to unbox it. Hope is defined as a feeling of expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. So I'm gonna read that again. It is a feeling of expectation. Let me ask you a question. When you come to church, do you come into this place with an expectation or do you come into this place just to check off the box so you can go home and feel good about yourself for another week? Honest question. I did that for a long time. So please understand, I'm not asking you something that I haven't done already in my life. I would show up to church and sit in the back and listen to the sermon, be the first one out the door so I could go see God. I was in your house. Are you happy now? That's how I spent my years through college, just going to church to check a box. But when I grew up and I understood that when you show up to the house of God with expectation, you don't leave disappointed. See, all throughout scripture, people will come to the house of God expecting 
expecting something and they may not have left with what they wanted, but they left with what they needed every single time. There's a story of a, of a beggar, of a crippled beggar who sat outside the temple and he would beg for coins from the people going into the house because he knew they're in a right state of mind. They're there to give God their 10%. They're coming in to get something from God. Maybe I could get a little bit of something from them before they walk in the house so they feel a little more holy as they walk into the presence of God. And he would sit out there with his hand out and beg for things. He was crippled and he would beg. And one day he's sitting outside the temple and he looks at these two men he's never seen before. Their names are Peter and John. And Peter and John are walking into the temple and he goes, hey, I need some money. I can't work because I'm crippled. Will you give me something? And Peter looks back at the man. He goes, I'll tell you what, dude. Silver and gold, I don't have. But what I do have... I'm going to give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, stand up and walk. And that moment, that man's legs got strength in him, and he stood to his feet, and he began to walk, and he walked into the very temple he used to be outside of, and he walked into the house and began to give glory to God for the miracle that happened. Why? Because he had an expectation. He had an expectation. He showed up looking for something. He didn't know what it was. He just knew he needed something. And he said, God, I'm gonna sit outside of your house and hopefully maybe somebody will give me something to fill my belly today. But what he walked away with that day was a healing and a revelation of his spirit that the God of the universe cares about him. He walked away with something because he showed up expecting. What do you expect when you walk in the house of God? Because hope is a feeling of expectation. Not wishing, expect, I expect this to happen. Why do I expect it to happen? Because I know what the God of the Bible says. His promises are, and they are for sure, and they are yes and amen. And I know that when the God pray, I know when I talk to the Lord, I expect him to answer, and he will answer. That is my expectation. It is an expectation and a desire for a certain thing to happen. Certain. A certain thing. Not an ambivalent thing, not a random thing, not a guess that you're going to throw out in the universe. A certain thing to happen. I hope for a certain thing to take place in my life. There are so many reasons that we're to have hope, and hope is mentioned 316 times in the Bible. Wow. Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11 is just one of them. It says, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you, not to harm you. Plans to give you a hope and a future. You walk in here this morning going, I don't have a clue what my future holds. I know a lot of people are looking forward to 2024. I'm not looking forward to 2024 because my 2023 was so bad. I don't even want to get to 2024. I don't think that my 2024 has much hope. I don't care about my future. I'm just trying to survive today. I'm here to tell you that a relationship with Jesus Christ will give you a hope that will guarantee you a future. Period. Nothing else matters. A relationship with Jesus gets you the hope that you're looking for when you walk in this place this morning. Psalm 42, 11 says, why my soul are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my savior and my God. He says, put your hope in God. Not put your hope in a government. Yeah. Not put your hope in a family. Yeah. Not put your hope in a job. Yeah. Not put your hope in new friends. He says, put your hope in the only one who can give you what you need. Isaiah chapter 40, verse 31 says, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not faint. You know, sometimes you get tired. Duh. That was an amen moment for some of y'all. Some of y'all are sitting there going, amen. <laughs> sometimes you get tired. Sometimes you get a little weary, you get a little drained, you've given everything you've got and you feel like everyone wants more. I've given everything I have, but they want just a little bit more. Sometimes you get weary, but the Bible says that if you put your hope in God, he will renew your strength. Romans 15, 13 says, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. You know why the power of the Holy Spirit? Because the Holy Spirit is a great comforter. Yeah. And you know what you need in the middle of hopeless situations? Comfort. Yeah. Okay, I'm gonna preach this out of the room for a minute. The Holy Spirit is a great comforter. 
That's what God calls him. That's what Jesus says. I will send the comforter to be with you. He's talking about the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is a great comforter. And you know what you need in the middle of hopeless situations? You need some comfort. It's gonna be all right. I'm with you. No, Ryan, don't quit. I'm with you. I know this seems impossible. Don't give up yet. I know this seems really hard. Just trust me. I'm with you. Ryan, I know you don't think you can go, you can go any further. Just lean on me, and I'm going to help you get to the finish line. Ryan, I understand that this is difficult and it's hard, but I promise you, if you'll let me comfort you in difficulty, we'll get to the promise. Yeah. Romans chapter 5, verse 3 through 4. Are you guys with me? Yeah. If you're not, the few of you are, here we go. Romans chapter five, it says, not only so, but we also glory in our suffering because we know that suffering produces perseverance. Perseverance, character, and character produces what? Hope. This morning, I wanna focus on that last verse. Romans chapter five, verse three through four. Let's unbox that for a minute. Let's unbox what hope is. And let me say this, before we say what hope is, hope is not. Hope is not, hope that is not in God is not hope, it's a wish. And we don't wish upon a star. We have a hope through the blood of a savior. Yeah. Wishing produces disappointment. Hope in God produces faith. Yeah. Yeah. A wish comes from a selfish desire, but hope develops godly character that will last. Yeah. You need to understand what hope is. Yeah. So we're gonna unbox hope. This is what I know about hopeless situations is that life has a lot of them. It can be easily, it, life can easily become depressing and difficult Life can get to such a place that you see no hope, you feel no joy, you believe there's no hope for a future, but Paul breaks down what hope is and how we get it. And one more time before I open this box and show you what's inside of hope, I wanna make something emphatically clear to you. The hope we have comes from one place and one place alone, and that is in a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hope comes from one place and one place alone a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Will you say, God, I'm done doing this thing by myself. I can't do life the way I've been doing it anymore. It doesn't work for me. I'm not getting where I wanna get and I'm not feeling the way I wanna feel. I'm not enjoying life the way that you said I should be enjoying it to the fullest. What do I need? You need a relationship with Jesus to forgive us of our sins and give us an opportunity for a fresh start so we can live for him and we will find hope. That's hope. So let's unbox this thing. 1 Timothy 1.1, 1, 1, Paul writes, Paul, an apostle of Christ, Jesus, by the command of God, our Savior, and our, and our hope. We're clear where hope comes from. It doesn't come from a better job, a better spouse, a nicer paycheck, better friends, or anything you can do for yourself. Hope is from the Lord. So the first thing that we understand, where, what, what comes from hope? How do we get hope? Here's what Paul, here's what Paul wrote, writes. Words are hard. Here's what Paul writes in Romans chapter 5. The first thing that Paul says, if you want some hope, hope comes with some of this. Now, Pastor Ryan, this is not the Christmas message I wanted today. What are you doing? Welcome to Limitless Church. We're, uh, we're here to take the limits off the way you see Jesus' faith in the church. And I'm not gonna sit here and make you feel good. I'm gonna sit here and preach truth so you can walk out and you can live a life that is significant, impactful, and meaningful and so that when you hit difficult times and suffering in your life, you'll know how to make it through and you won't quit. See, here's the thing about a lot of us in life. We don't like suffering. No one likes suffering unless you're a Raider fan. Then you love it apparently. But none of us really like suffering. Hold on, say, I, I, hold on. Whoa, 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 whoa. Before you start throwing things at me, hold on. I had to. It's low-hanging fruit. It's easy to pick on. But I'm a Seahawk fan, and I get it too. So don't worry about it, all right? Don't, don't worry about it. <laughs> get some Raider fans. going to be like, I'm writing you an email. It's going to be really angry. <laughs> the amplified version of this verse says this. Let us exult and triumph in our troubles and rejoice in our sufferings, knowing that pressure and affliction and hardship produce patient and unswerving endurance. See, suffering is designed as a state of undergoing pain, distress, or hardship. See, what Paul's writing about isn't suffering 
because he made a bad life choice. This is suffering because of persecution of his faith in Jesus Christ. See, a lot of us go through suffering because we made some really bad life choices and we go, oh God, why do you give your toughest battles to your strongest soldiers? Oh, which by the way, that's not in the scriptures. That is not a thing. That is not a thing. Some of us are so confused. God, I'm just God's strongest soldier. He puts me through it all the time. No, you just make bad decisions, man. <laughs> Figure it out. We don't like suffering. No one wants to suffer. My boys yesterday, we went and cut down a big oak tree at my friend's house, and I had to cut it up, a whole bunch of little pieces, and my boys had to pick it up, throw it in the truck. And then we get home, and then to get it out of the truck and throw it in the side yard and stack it up, and they were hungry. Dad, we're suffering. You're not suffering, you're hungry. There's a difference. You need to know the difference. This is hard work and suffering. This is work. Suffering is something entirely different. You've never known it your entire life because you got a good life because you're raised in my house. You don't even know what suffering is. Some of us go through some difficult seasons, and then we go, this is too hard. I can't do it. God, I can't handle it. Handle it, take it away from me. And what does God do? I'm gonna send my son who will be a perfect example. You think you're suffering. Why don't you look up how the disciples lived life after Jesus left? Why don't you look up the way Jesus spent his last few hours alive before he was resurrected? See, suffering is taking 39 lashes on the back and then having your beard torn out. Yeah. Suffering is having a crown of thorns shoved into your head and then had a cross put on your back and you gotta carry that cross miles to where they would then nail you on that cross. And on the way to you being nailed to that cross, the people you came and died for, the people that you called friends, the people that said that they follow you to the ends of the earth that now have abandoned you are spitting on you and ridiculing you on the way and then you get to that hill and they nail you to that cross and they're mocking you saying if you are the son of God come down from there that's suffering but suffering produces perseverance and perseverance develops character and character is where we get our hope God I'm suffering you want to be like my son learn what suffering is Learn that in the midst of suffering, I'm with you. I'm not gonna leave you. I'm not gonna forsake you. Nobody likes to suffer. Nobody looks for opportunities to suffer. But as Paul is correct, that suffering is necessary to build toward hope, that means that you and I may need to go through some seemingly hopeless situations to get to a place where we know the hope is. But we don't like to go through those seasons because they're difficult, they're uncomfortable, but remember that Jesus said in John 16, 33, throw that verse up on the screen. John 16, 33, Jesus said, I have told you these things so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. Pastor Ryan, why is my life so difficult? Why is it so hard? I gave my life to Jesus and I've come to church and I'm honoring God with my tithe and I'm following him and I'm getting rid of the things in my life that I shouldn't have and I'm cutting out the distractions and I'm changing some of my relationships. Why is my life so difficult? Because Jesus promised you in the world you'd have troubles, but not to get discouraged, he would overcome the world and he would give you a hope. So we have to quit running from hardship. Hear me, quit running from hardship. Quit running from suffering and let God help you through it. He's not gonna deliver you from suffering. He's gonna help you in the suffering. He's not gonna deliver you from the valley. He'll help you get through the valley. He's not gonna deliver you from trouble, but he'll be with you in trouble. You know the story of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. The three Hebrew sons that the King Nebuchadnezzar built this massive statue and said, as soon as you hear the music, I want you to bow down and worship this image that I put up. And the entire nation bowed down and started to worship this image. And the three of them stood tall and said, we will not bow down to a false God because we serve the real God. And the king said, come to me. And they came to him and he said, if you don't bow down and worship my God that I put in front of you, I'm gonna throw you into a furnace and burn you alive. And they said, we want you to know, king, that the God we serve can and deliver us from this suffering. But if he doesn't, we want you to know we're still not gonna bow down and worship that God. And what happens? He binds them and he throws them into a furnace that he made seven times hotter. Not entirely sure how you calculate that, but it was seven times hotter than it originally was meant to be. And they're thrown into the fire. And as soon as they get in the fire, they're in the suffering. They're in the season. They're supposed to be at their worst. What does the king say? 
How many did I throw in there? Uh, three. And the king goes, I see three and a fourth. And the fourth one looks like the son of God. Um, Yo, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, come out. So they come walking out. Not four of them, three. Because he's with you in the middle of it and he'll help you get out of it. Four were in, three came out. They come stand before the king and they don't even smell like smoke. And he says, what happened? You didn't burn. We told you, king. The God we serve is able to deliver us. And the king says, from this day forward, the God of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego will be the God of this nation. Here's the point. Listen to me. I'm going somewhere with this. What if the suffering you're going through is meant for the people around you to see God move in your situation and encourage them and let them see what God can do in the middle of difficulty? And so, yes, you're going through it, but God is going to use it to be a testimony to other people to show them how good he is in the middle of difficulty. And if you run from your suffering and you run from the persecution and you run from the hardship, they will never see God move in that situation where they can then know his power. What if what you're going through is designed for God to be able to use it to reach other people through the testimony you're going to have when you get through it? Pastor Ron, I don't want to suffer. I understand. I don't either. But there's purpose in it. There's purpose in it. And I'm talking about suffering for the cause of Christ. I'm not talking about suffering because you didn't get your oil changed and now you're stranded on the side of the freeway. I'm not talking about that. Not today, devil. Well, if you got your oil changed yesterday, today wouldn't be a problem. So I'm saying. You got to understand the kind of suffering Paul's talking about. Suffering for the cause of Christ. Can you imagine how many people would have changed their view of God if they get to see you go through it and watch God move in your life through it? First thing is suffering. The second thing that Paul mentions in hope is perseverance. Again, this is not your typical hope Christmas sermon, and I'm sorry, but I'm not sorry. Perseverance. To persevere. See, perseverance is the persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in achieving success. It is the persistence in doing something despite difficulty or delay in in success. How many of y'all have ever started a diet? Raise your hand, be honest. Don't t- tell the truth, shame the devil. How many of y'all have ever started a diet right now? Raise your hand. Raise your hand, you started a diet. I got my hand up. How many of y'all have not persisted in that diet? <laughs> yeah, we lack per- perseverance when it comes to some stuff. We don't have it. It's really hard to have, to have a good eating program when I have an 11-year-old boy and a 9-year-old boy and their metabolisms are sky high and all they eat is Cheez-Its and chocolate chip cookies all day and they don't ever get fat and I look at it and I'm gaining 10 pounds. That's really frustrating. It's hard. But you got to persevere. And so I won't quit mentality. I will persevere despite the obstacles and the delays and the difficulty that I encounter because I know that what God has promised, he will deliver. We never find success or favor when we quit a difficulty. Hope comes when you have faced opposition and you keep going. See, the devil can't stop the church, but he can get some of you to quit. See, if he can get some of you to quit, then this is what happens. We're a part of a body, right? And what if the foot decides, I don't want to do this anymore. It's getting really hard. I quit. Now, all of a sudden, our body is crippled in that area because you quit instead of persevered. And what the devil wants to do is get enough of us to quit that the body becomes so incapable of mobility that we're not doing what it is we're supposed to do because parts of our body don't want to persevere. We just want to quit. We just want to quit. Shut it down. It's too hard. God, I thought this thing was health, wealth, and prosperity. And I want to name it and claim it. I'm going to tell you the, the gospel is not name and claim it. The gospel is die to yourself, pick up a cross, and follow Jesus. That's the gospel. The gospel isn't health, wealth, and prosperity. The gospel is die to yourself, pick up a cross, and follow Jesus. 
Too many marriages fail because of suffering and problems. And when they come, we run and quit instead of persevering and allowing character to grow so that our future generations have hope. If our children see us quit, then learn that quitting in, in, in difficulty is acceptable, then that's what they're gonna do. But if they see us persevere and endure through it, then they understand what it means to grow through the struggle. Yeah. See, I have two little boys. I have two little boys. Three years ago, my wife and I went through the most difficult season of our marriage because of something that happened that I did. And my wife and I fought. It was hard. There were arguments, there were fights, there were difficulties. There were days that we didn't want to talk to each other and there were nights we didn't want to see each other. There were things that came about through a difficult season that were really, really hard. But I can tell you this, that through every single night and every single morning and every day, my sons saw my wife and I come together and pray through the difficulty. They saw us sit down together and eat meals together. They saw us tell each other, we love you despite the difficulty. They saw us persevere. We didn't quit going to church. We didn't quit reading our Bible. We didn't we didn't quit praying. We didn't quit giving God glory. We didn't quit praising him through the difficulty. And now my sons understand what it means to persevere through difficulty and to have a won't quit mentality in our house. So when my boys grow up and they marry the love of their lives and they go through hardship, they won't quit either because they saw the example in their mother and their father. That's what it means to have perseverance. And that's what it means to push through. You don't quit just cause it's hard. You persevere. See, the reason so many people fall away from their relationship with God is because they've been sold this false perspective of what it means to follow Jesus. Yeah. Following Jesus is the greatest thing you'll ever do. It's the greatest gift you'll ever have given to you, forgiveness of your sin. That's the greatest gift because the wages of my sin, what I deserve is death. But Jesus took that death and he gave me a hope for a future. And following Jesus is the greatest thing I've ever done. But it doesn't mean that there's not hardship. It doesn't mean it's not difficult. It means it'll be worth it. My life has purpose. My life has meaning. My life carries value because of what Jesus did for me. And when we can get through suffering and we can persevere in that suffering, then the third thing that comes with hope when you get through suffering and you persevere through it is character. It's not very big, is it? It doesn't seem like a big thing. Character doesn't seem like a big deal until you don't have it. Character doesn't seem like a big deal until you're looking for a man to marry who has some. And then you realize how far it is and how difficult it is to find someone with godly character. See, character is built when you go through some suffering and you persevere in it. And when you've gone through suffering and persevered, now you have a character that won't be shaken. Here's why. Here's why. I have suffered and I've seen that God didn't abandon me in my difficulty. I have been able to persevere because he gave me the strength to get through it. And now the character that I have is created from those things, which means it doesn't matter what else comes my way. He is the rock I stand on and I will not be shaken. And my character isn't going to be moved. I know who I am now because I know who God has been for me before. So I know what I stand on because he's been with me in the difficulty. He's given me the strength to get through it. And now this is who I am. That's what develops character. See, character isn't how much money I make. Character isn't how many friends I have. Character isn't the car I drive. Character isn't the clothes I wear. Character isn't my zip code. Character isn't any of the things that I can make for myself. Character comes when you've suffered a little bit and you persevered and you know who it is that got you through it. That's character. Character is the moral qualities distinctive to an individual. The moral qualities that are distinct to you. Your character, what defines you, 
Suffering produces perseverance, which then builds into a character that produces hope that cannot be shaken. 1 Corinthians 15, 15, 33 says, don't be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Who do you spend your time with? Who are you hanging out with? Who are you speaking to and who are you allowing to speak into you? Because if bad company corrupts good character, then good company will build good character. Jesus surrounded himself with good people. They were not heads. They did some dumb stuff. Peter wasn't a good swordsman, though he tried to be. He did some dumb things, but Jesus surrounded himself with good people. He also allowed other people into his world that he spoke into, but they didn't speak into him. Understand this. I hang out with sinners and prostitutes and tax collectors. Pastor Ryan, no. Jesus hung out with those people because they came to him to be changed. They didn't change who he was. Who are you spending your time with? Who are you allowing to influence your life? Who are you allowing to speak into you? Character. Why do we know that what we have in God, hope in God, because the character of God never changes. Hebrews 13, 8 says that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. We're going to say this together. Read it together with me. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He's not going to change. He hasn't changed because of your sin, and he's not going to change for you to sin. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. And his character doesn't change. And if we get hope from godly character, then we need to understand the character we need to pursue is that of the character of God. See, hope says, I may not see it now, but I've seen him do it before. Hope says, I don't see how, but I know who will make a way. Hope says, I don't have to depend on what I produce, but I know I can depend on what he promised. Hope says, it may be difficult now, but this too shall pass. Hope says, if I don't get tired of doing what is right, I know I will reap a harvest of righteousness. Hope says, the numbers may not add up, but I know that if I honor God with my money, he will multiply what I have left. Yeah. Hope, not a wish, a hope. A hope that is found in Jesus Christ that will not waver, that will not fade, that will not change, that will not give up, that will not let me down, hope. 